I have an old-fashioned belief that I can only should expect to make money in things that I understand. And when I say understand, I don't mean understand, you know, what the product does or anything like that. I mean understand what the economics of the business are likely to look at, look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I know, in general, what the economics of, say, Wrigley chewing gum will look like 10 years from now. The internet isn't going to change the way people chew gum. It isn't going to change which gum they chew. You know, if you own the chewing gum market in a big way, and you've got double mint and spearmint and juicy fruit, those brands will be there 10 years from now. So I can't pinpoint exactly what the numbers are going to look like on Wrigley, but I'm not going to be way off if I try to look forward on something like that. That evaluating that company is within what I call my circle of competence. I understand what they do, I understand the economics of it, I understand the competitive aspects of the business. There can be all kinds of companies that have wonderful futures, but I don't know which ones they are. I mean, uh, I've given talks in the past where I carry with me a 70-page, tightly printed list, and it shows 2,000 auto companies. Now, if at the start of the 20th century, you had seen what the auto was going to do to this country, the impact it would have on the lives of then your children and grandchildren and so on. That what it, it just, it transformed the American landscape. But if those 2,000 companies, you know, three basically survive, and they haven't done that well uh, at many times. So how do you pick three winners out of 2,000? I mean, it's not so easy to do. It's easy when you look back. But it's not so easy looking forward. So you could have been dead right on, on the fact that the auto industry, in fact, you probably couldn't have predicted how big an impact it would have. But you wouldn't have, if, you, if you'd bought companies across the board, you wouldn't have made any money. Because the economic characteristics of that business were not easy to define. Um, I said, I, I've always said the easier thing to do is figure out who loses. And what you really should have done in 1905 or so, when you saw what was going to happen, with the auto is you should have gone short horses. There were 20 million horses in 1900 and there's about 4 million horses now. So it's easy to figure out the losers. You know, the loser is the horse. But the winner was the auto overall. But 2,000 companies just about failed. A few merged out and so on. Uh, there were three companies, auto companies, in the Dow Industrials in the 1920s and 30s. Studebaker, Nash Calvinator and Hudson Motor. Now those names are all familiar to me and maybe some of them are familiar to you, but they're not making any cars. You know, they didn't make money. And yet at one time, they were in the Dow 30. They were the aristocrats of American business. And they got creamed. So figuring out the economic characteristics of a, the winners in a wonderful business are, is not easy. In North Carolina, you know, Orville and Wilbur took off, or I guess Orville took off and Wilbur watched. I'd have been Wilbur. Uh, <laughs> but if you could have seen the future of the airline business from that point forward and how that would transform things, you know, it would, it would have blown you away. And it's excited people, incidentally, ever since. But if there had been a capitalist at Kitty Hawk, he should have shot Orville down. I mean, it, uh, because it's done nothing but cost investors money. There were over 400 airplane companies in the 1920s and 30s alone. There was an Omaha. There was a Nebraska. We were the Silicon Valley, of, of, uh, apparently, of aircraft. And they all disappeared. It's been a terrible business. At the end of 1991, if you'd added up the aggregate earnings from all airline companies with billions poured in, since Wilbur and Orville were down there, they came to less than zero. The number of passengers went up every year. You know, the importance of the industry was dramatically increased decade by decade, and nobody made any money. It, uh, so figuring out the economic consequences, TV, I think there's, I don't know, 20, 25 million sets a year sold in the United States. I don't think there's one of them made in the United States anymore. I mean, you'd say TV set manufacturer, what a wonderful business. I mean, everybody, now nobody had a TV in 1950, they're about 45 to 50. Everybody has multiple sets now. Nobody is in the United States has made any real money making the sense that they're all out of business. You know, the Magnavoxes, the RCAs, all of those companies. Radio was the equivalent of the 20, over 500 companies making radios in the 1920s. Again, I don't think there's a, a 
a U.S. radio manufacturer at the present time. But Coca-Cola, you know, what was it, 1884, Jacob's Pharmacy or whatever, the fellow comes up with something, a lot of co copiers over the years, but now you've got a company that is selling roughly 1.1 billion eight ounce servings of its product, not all Coke, Sprite, and some others, daily throughout the world 117 years later. So understanding the economic characteristics of a business is different than predicting the fact that an industry is going to do wonderfully. And so when I look at the internet businesses or I look at tech businesses, I say this is a marvelous thing and I love to play around on the computer and it, now I order my books from Amazon and all kinds of things, but I don't know who's going to win. And unless I know who's going to win, I'm not interested in investing. I'll just play around on the computer. And uh, uh, <laughs> Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is and staying inside of it is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And, and you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it and the stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should. Yeah. I like I like businesses I can understand. We'll start with that. That narrows it down about 90%. I mean, <laughs> now, see, I, there's all kinds of things I don't understand, but fortunately, there's enough I do understand. And you got this big, wide world out there. Almost every company's publicly owned, so you got you got all American business practically available to you. Now, to start with, it doesn't make sense to go with things that you think you can understand, but you can understand some things. I can understand this. I mean, you can understand this. Anybody can understand this. I mean, this is a product that basically hasn't been changed much they've added the cherry uh, but you know since 1886 or whatever it was and it's a simple business it's it's not an easy business I don't want a business that's easy for competitors so I want a business with a moat around it I want a very valuable castle in the middle and then I want to I want to I, I, I want the Duke who's in charge of that castle to be honest and hard-working and able and then I want a big moat around the castle and that moat can be various things the moat in a business like our auto insurance business at Geico is low cost. I mean, people have to buy auto insurance, so everybody's going to have one auto insurance policy per per car, basically, uh, or per driver. And and you, you, I can't sell them twenty, you know, but but they have to buy one. When are they going to buy it on? They're going to buy it on based on service and cost. Most people will assume the service is fairly uh, identical among companies or close enough, so they're going to do it on cost. So I got to be the low cost producer. That's my moat. To the extent I, my costs get further lower than the other guy, I've thrown a couple of sharks into the moat. You know? But all the time, if you've got a wonderful castle, there are people out there who are going to try and attack it and take it away from you. And I want a castle that I can understand, but I want a castle with a moat around it. Thirty years ago, Eastman Kodak's moat was, was just as wide as Coca-Cola's moat. I mean, if you were going to take a picture of your six-month-old baby, and you're going to want to look at that picture 20 years from now, and you're going to want to look at it 50 years from now, and you're never going to get a chance. I mean, you're not a professional photographer so that you can evaluate what's going to look good 20 or 50 years ago. What is in your mind about that, about that photography company is what counts because they are promising you that the picture you take today is going to be terrific to look at 20 or 30 or 50 years from now about something that's very important to you, maybe your own child or whatever it may be. Well, Kodak had that in spades 30 years ago. They owned that. They had what I call share of mind. Forget about share of market, share of mind. They had something in everybody's mind around the country around the world with a little yellow box and everything that said Kodak is the best. That's priceless. They've lost some of that. They haven't lost it all and, and it's not due to George Fisher who runs George is doing a great job. But they let that moat narrow. They let Fuji come and start narrowing the moat in various ways. They let them get into the Olympics and take away that special aspect that only only Kodak was fit to photograph the Olympics. So Fuji gets there and immediately in people's minds Fuji becomes more on a parody with, with Kodak. You haven't seen that with Coke. Coke's moat is wider now than it was 30 years ago. You can't see the moat day by day, but every time you know, the infrastructure gets built in some country that isn't yet profitable for Coke but will be 20 years from now, the moat is widening a little bit. The things are all the time changing that moat in one direction or the other. 
Ten years from now, you can see the difference. Our managers of the businesses we run, I've, I've got one message to them, you know, which is to widen the moat. And we want to we wanna throw crocodiles and sharks and everything else, <laughs> gators, I guess, <laughs> into, the, into the moat to keep away competitors. And that that's, comes about through service. It comes about through quality of product. It comes about through cost. It comes about sometimes through patents. It comes about through real estate location. So that's the business I'm looking for. Now, what kind of businesses am I going to find like that? Well, I'm going to find them. I'm going to find them in simple products, because I'm not going to be able to figure out what the moat's going to look like for Oracle or Lotus or Microsoft ten years from now. I mean, I, uh, Gates is the best businessman I've ever run into, and you know they've got a hell of a position. But I really don't know what that business is going to look like ten years from now, and I certainly don't know what his competitors' businesses are going to look like ten years from now. Now I'll name one I don't own. I know what the chewing gum business is going to look like from 10 years from now. I mean, the Internet is not going to change how we chew gum. It's, and, and nothing much else is going to change how we chew gum. And then are there going to be lots of new products? Is it really, you know, our spearmint and juicy fruit and all those going to evaporate? So it isn't going to happen. You give me a billion dollars and tell me to go in the chewing gum business and try and make a real dent in Wrigley's, I can't do it. And that's the way I think about businesses. I say to myself, Give me a billion dollars and how much can I hurt the guy? Give me ten billion dollars. Give me ten billion dollars and how much can I hurt Coca-Cola around the world? I can't do it. Well, those are good businesses. Now, give me some money and tell me to hurt somebody in, in some other fields and I can figure out how to do it. But, uh, so I want a simple business, easy to understand, great economics now, honest and able management. And, and uh, then I can see about in a general way where they're going to be ten years from now. And if I can't see where they're going to be ten years from now, I don't want to buy it. Basically, I don't want to buy any stock where if they close the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow for five years, I won't be happy owning it. I buy a farm and I don't get a quote on it for five years, and I'm happy if the farm does okay. You know, I buy an apartment house, don't get a quote on it for five years, I'm happy if the apartment house produces the returns that I expect. But people buy a stock and they look at the price the next morning and they decide whether they're doing well or not doing well. It's, it's crazy because they're buying a piece of a business. That's what Graham the most fundamental part of, of what he taught me. You know. You're not buying a stock, you're buying a, you're buying a part ownership in a business. You will do well if the business does well and if you didn't pay a totally silly price. And that's what it's all about. And you ought to buy businesses you understand. Just like if you're buying farms, you ought to buy farms you understand. It, it, it's, it's not complicated. But, uh, and so, in calling us Graham Buffett, I mean, it's just pure Graham. I, I, I was very fortunate because I, I picked up a book when I was 19 I got interested in stocks when I was about six or seven, and I bought my first stock when I was 11, but I was playing around with all this stuff. You know, I had charts and volume, and I'm making all kinds of technical calculations and everything, and then I picked up a little book, and it just said that you're not buying some little ticker symbol that bounces around every day. You're buying, you're buying a part of a business, and as soon as I started thinking about it that way, everything else followed. It very simple. So we buy businesses we think we can understand. There's no one here that can't understand the Coca-Cola company. I would say there's no one here that can understand uh, some new internet company. And I said at the annual meeting this year that if I were teaching a class in business school on the final exam, I would pass out the information on an internet company and ask each student to value it. And anybody that gave me an answer, I'd flunk. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> But people do it every day. I mean, it's more exciting. I mean, if, if, if you look at it like going to the races or something, you know, that's that's a different thing. But if you're investing, I mean, investing is putting out money to be sure of getting more money back later, you know, at an appropriate rate. And, and to do that, you have to understand what you're doing it in. I mean, you have to understand the business. And you can understand some businesses, but not all businesses. Yep.